Hey, hey, welcome friends to the Future Belongs to Creators podcast. I am Haley and I'm here with my normal co-hosts, Charlie and Miguel. And today we have a very special guest, uh, a good friend, Thomas Doolin, who is joining us from his Nashville studio. How's it going, friends? Hey. I'm glad that you think we're normal, Haley. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as that came out of my mouth, I literally said, why did I say normal? But I just got away with it. I'm glad to be not included in the normal friends category. And I'm the weird and included friend. in the cool Nashville studio yeah. friend category. I'm happy yeah. with that. Uh, yes. And for those of you who are uh, watching... Um, Watching us, Thomas's location should look kind of familiar because Alyssa, uh, who was a guest on uh, the podcast, what was it, like three weeks ago or so, she was hanging out in that studio because Thomas is, um, last time I, I think I messed up and I accidentally said you were Alyssa's better half. And that's not what I meant. You guys are equally each other's better half. She's definitely the better half. It's fine. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, Alyssa was uh, joined us from the, the studio as well. So Thomas has got like the perfect podcast studio. It's the most soundproof, um, soundproof studio compared to the rest of us here. Best mic, all the things, you know. But Thomas, how's it going? What's the good word in Nashville today? You know, it's it's uh, it's a little chilly today, but yeah, I'm really grateful to have the studio. And I forgot that I, I listened to a little bit of Alyssa's episode, which is awesome. Uh, but I forgot that she did it out here because we have some construction going on in the house and a cat that's really needy. So, and she <laughs> does her podcast uh, as well. So she's normally um, set up in the house. But yeah, it's good. We don't have any construction today, luckily, and um, yeah, things are good here. So. Thanks for having me on. Good deal. All right. Well, let's kick it off with our first uh, our first section um, for today. Have you heard? Who wants to go first? I'm going to announce. I think Charlie should go first. Okay, great. You ask the question <laughs> and then you delegate. I love it. Um, my have you heard, which you might have if you hang it on Twitter like I do, um, is that Taylor Lawrence, who is a, like a key reporter in the creator economy, right? I'm pretty sure we've even done a article discussion episode in the past on one of her pieces of writing. Um, she's moved from the New York Times to being a columnist for the Washington Post. And a part of the reason behind it, as I understand it, is that the New York Times was taking issue with its reporters building like personal brands and being such, you know, big, well-known brands on their own, separate from mm. the, the news outlet. Um, so yeah, that started a lot of discussion. And yeah, that's uh, an interesting, interesting thing, I think, for the creator economy to see see this happen, to see such a prolific creator move because of this. Um, yeah, I think companies are going to be held back if they don't let their staff build brands and, you know, be creators on the side. Wow, that's really interesting. I wonder if that same thing would apply to someone as prolific as like a Michael Barbaro, right? Because yeah. he has a mega personal brand. Uh Michael Barbaro, for anyone that doesn't know, is um, he produces the uh, the Daily the podcast, Daily. Mm -hmm. yeah, which is arguably one of New York Times' probably biggest, be most well known podcasts for sure. Miguel, what do you got for us? Oh. The, the difference was there just quickly that I, I think that Taylor is more like outspoken on Twitter <laughs> than Michael Barbaro mm -hmm. is, and so maybe the New York Times was was having issues with that I don't know, but yeah, there's um, a bunch of articles about out there you could read interesting about you Twitterverse, watch. you know. <laughs> the Twitterverse. Miguel, what do you got for us? Yeah. So um, mine's actually just, it's probably not breaking news to anybody because it's so far reaching, but um, I thought it'd be cool to mention today, especially with Thomas being here. And that's uh, Apple unveiling uh, those news things yesterday. Uh, they, amongst other things, the coolest things were like the new display and a new uh, like desktop uh, Mac mini, which isn't so many. It's like two Mac minis on top of each other. It looks like a weird <laughs> box. Um, not the most beautiful thing I've ever seen, but apparently it like, I mean, you can, if you fully spec that thing out, it's like six grand just for the little box. Uh, and then, you know, you throw and the you display add the screen on, on there. Top. Yeah, yeah <laughs> the, the screen, I think if you totally max everything out, it can creep up to like 10 Gs. So, well, the crazy uh, thing about it is actually that the, the previous model was the Mac, their like newest Mac Pro. If you scope that out fully, it was over fifty thousand U.S. dollars. Did you see this? Jeez, seriously? Like, yeah. It like you could have up to like. So I this think one's it was cheap one, in comparison. Yeah, it was like <laughs> over a terabyte of RAM, and this one is faster. 
Yeah, because of wow. the silicon or whatever, because they're not using the, the M1 chip. chips. Yeah, yeah. It's so it's so crazy how they can just like th that's a great strategy. It's like you make a product that's insane. That's like I think it's like a thousand dollars for the wheels or something stupid like yeah. that. Uh, and it <laughs> does, and uh, the monitor doesn't even come with the stand. The stand is like extra. So like you make it impossibly expensive. And then when you come out when you come out with your ten thousand dollar offering, it seems like a steal. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I feel the, like this is something are... creators should take advice from, though. Apple's yeah, go buy it. Go buy a fifty thousand yeah, yeah. dollar computer. <laughs> but it is exciting. I mean, for people like Thomas who are like, you know, music and music production, and like, if you're in a studio, I mean, they're obviously marketing it to those people because it's literally it's called, called like, the Mac yeah, Studio. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it's just pretty crazy. It's mm. it's really the, the the technology is getting nuts, and and really like it's overpowered for music. Like, I run a Mac Mini that's from 2018 and it's amazing it has 32 gigs of ram that's like honestly even that is overpowered but the people that are in need of computers like that are like rendering 3d visual effects and like you know in rendering real time. video yeah and like <laughs> they need 5k multiple 5k displays and all this stuff like music production is sort of hit its ceiling of how in my opinion of like how technologically uh, demanding it's going to be on computers but it's it's nice mm -hmm. for it to be fast for sure. It's the same for design. I don't need anything more than the iMac Pro that I have, but yeah. I still added that Mac Studio to my cart and then decided mm -hmm. not to follow through when I saw it was going to be about five thousand euros for the, yeah. the setup that I wanted. <laughs> See, I think I, I I'm one of those people that thinks that they need the best but don't need any of it for any purpose. So um... well, they, Matt, Apple does a great job making you feel like you need these things, even though you really <laughs> oh, yeah. don't. <laughs> I know it. I know it. Um, all right. Uh, moving on. Um, my have you heard was that Epic Games, which is um, the company behind the Royal Battle Royale game Fortnite, which everybody uh, knows. I'm not a gamer, so I didn't actually know that. <laughs> you didn't know Fortnite existed? No, no, no. Hey, I, knew, no, no, no. Oh. I knew Fortnite. I didn't know. <laughs> okay, okay. I didn't know that the like Epic yeah, Games made it. I didn't that's know fair. Epic that's games. completely. I could, I could tell that you were out of your element when you called it. The battle royale game, the royale of, game. Of Fortnite, as if anybody needed a qualifier. Like, oh, that Fortnite. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, anyways, um, they recently acquired Bandcamp, um, which for anyone that knows is... Wow. Um, did you not know this, Thomas? I didn't know that. Wow. That, yes. I don't know, Have you I heard don't know how I feel about yeah. that. <laughs> yes. Same. Um, Same. Yeah. Yes. And they did this to develop an e-commerce powered marketplace for creators. And um, really what all of the articles are pretty much talking about is how this move basically solidifies, you know, the reason why companies are moving into the creator economy to kind of continue to serve, uh, serve that niche, which I think is really interesting. And um, a little tidbit about Bandcamp, if you didn't know this, is that um, under its revenue model, artists receive a net average of 82% of every sale, which is very different from a lot of the other models that are out that out there. So I'm really excited to see what happens here. Um, I wonder if that's from like that whole Travis Scott thing being such a success. When Travis Scott did a virtual concert uh, in Fortnite, and mm. they made a ton of money, so they're like, "Ooh, okay, music." More That's music. what I was thinking. Yeah. They're gonna have like, like virtual concerts with microtransactions to try to monetize some of that eighty-two percent margin, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm interesting. Well, let's move on to the bulk of this uh, this podcast today because we've got an awesome, exciting guest, and I just want to be able to, you know, Brad Thomas is honestly one of my favorite people for so many reasons. Uh, he's been a savior for creator sessions and helped me immensely um, figure out how to make the audio sound better, considering that he is a producer and an audio engineer. But Thomas, why don't you introduce the people? Uh, introduce yourself to the people. Tell us uh, who you are, what you do, and we'll go from there. Well, you're really sweet. Um, I love helping you. So when you when you text me, I, I'm happy to help always. Um, yeah, my name's Thomas Doolin, and I am, uh, I'm a producer, a music producer, and an engineer in Nashville. And I also um, split my time, so I I also tour for a living and do sound on the road uh, with different various artists, most mostly with um, Drew Holcomb and the Neighbors, and Drew and Ellie Holcomb. Um, yeah, I, I like to make records. I've always been like fascinated by making music and putting it together on my computer and stuff like that. And so, 
uh, I'm really fortunate that I get to do that for a living. Um, and I love ConvertKit. I'm married to Alyssa, like you said, and uh, so she helps uh, all your emails go to the inbox, which is great. And uh, <laughs> and I've learned so much about your company, and I'm I'm a big fan. So yeah, um, um, as you too. <laughs> yes, we are. In fact, uh, Thomas is actually the subject of a creator session that's going to be coming up here. Uh, I don't have the calendar in front of me. And I was going to say, what are you going to commit to publicly really right soon? Now? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's coming out really soon. And um, it's going to make you see why he's one of my favorite people, because he's really unbelievably humble and so good at his job. And actually, what we did for his creator session is we um, we were on site for two days and uh, were there while he was um, producing a song for a local artist named Morris Streppa. And it was just really cool to watch him in his element and to you know hang out in the studio and what you can't see is in front of him is i don't even know what you call it what's your your like mixing desk what is oh, that yeah this is my console here in front you can't really yes. see yeah and it's this like massive console table that has ten thousand buttons that's just super cool and you can't see that part of that <laughs> it's also from this it's from the the 70s right or 80s when, did, uh, when is this one is late 80s yeah yeah, which just like nice. makes it be, it's like an extra level, extra level of cool. Haley um, loves a really crazy expensive piece of furniture. So. Especially when they're vintage. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I do. I do. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is there's, and I'm pulling a bunch of this stuff from the time uh, that I spent with you, which like, um, you know, in, in the studio and some questions that we asked you during your creator session. And I'm not remembering this story exactly. So I want you to clarify it for me. And to be honest, I can't remember if you told me or if Drew Holcomb told me when we filmed his session in, perp in, in person. Um, but we were talking about how you ended up working with them. And it was something about you basically said, I'm going to work harder than anyone else. And I want to hear that origin story, because I think that it really is. Um, it's an, an important note to where you are today. Yeah. The funny thing about this story is that I... <laughs> I think to this day, don't remember telling <laughs> Drew this. So uh, it had to have been Drew uh, telling you because I forgot that this happened and I only remember it secondhand through him. Um, who's He's been kind enough to like tell it to a couple people, including me. So the way that it happened was um, I sort of got lucky and got an interview with Drew. I, I shouldn't have even been in the room but um, it was a sort of wild series of events of um, me getting on this email list, funny enough. Oh! Uh, there's this guy who uh, runs, this guy named Bob runs an email list for like 10 years called BobNet. And it literally started out, I mean, he has an AOL email address. It started out as like really small and he would just like, he was in the touring industry. And when he had a friend that was like, hey, do you know any lighting guys or whatever he would send an email campaign just text to whatever his list was and say does anybody know a lighting guy let me know i'll connect you with this with this tour or whatever and it grew and grew and grew and he ran it for free for wow. like over a decade and um i uh got to meet bob actually because he got me sort of this job anyway um he's a he's an awesome guy but he uh I, I, I shouldn't have been on the list, but I, I randomly met this stranger that I was vulnerable with and told him that I really needed a gig. And the guy was like, well, I'm on this weird like crew email list that I shouldn't even be on, but I could probably add you to it. And I was like, okay, yeah. So he emails Bob, gets me on the list. Two weeks later, one of the emails comes through and it's like, Nashville Band is looking for, and they never say who the artist is, Nashville Band looking for tour manager, sound guy, uh, you know, theaters, clubs, U.S. tour, fall tour, whatever. So I'm like, oh, okay, I'll respond, you know, send my resume, which wasn't very long, right? Like I was sort of, sort of still new to town. Um, but I did have a couple of friends that like Drew's manager knew. And so he was like, oh, that's cool. Like I trust that guy who's on your resume that, that you happen mm -hmm. to know. And uh, I, I Drew also says that like, he stalked me as you do when you're interviewing people on Instagram. And he saw that I had like posted a photo of my motorcycle and he thought like Drew likes motorcycles. So he's like, yeah, maybe let's interview this guy. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so 
<laughs> so he's he posts up at a coffee shop and he has these like hour blocks in East Nashville and I admittedly didn't I wasn't super familiar with his music beforehand um, but when I found out that I was interviewing for his tour I like crammed and listened to his records and I was like wow this is awesome like I'm really enjoying listening to the music um, and so I showed up for my interview and I knew that like I didn't have anybody beat on credentials or experience and according to Drew this was the punchline is that I told him that um, you know I, I wasn't going to be as experienced as anyone else he interviewed, but that I would commit to working harder than anyone else he interviewed and for less money. And uh, he was <laughs> like, well, I respect that. And um, so I got the fall tour. That was fall 2013. Um, and uh, so, yeah, still going strong nine years later. That's amazing. Yeah. That's like, that's the creator hustle right there. You totally. Know? It's saying like, this is an opportunity that I want and I am going to get it. Um, yeah, I was just committed to like, whatever this takes, like I, I really needed it. And also he pointed out later that like, I had, I talked about his record that had just come out. I was like, oh man, I love the drum sounds. Like, I think that's a great reference for your live show. I think, you know, we could, we could totally replicate that um, at, on your tour. And, and he said that no one else even like mentioned the music or anything and i was wow. like mm. that seems like a low bar but i'm glad that i did that <laughs> oh my gosh i love that um one of the other my other favorite stories from hanging out with you um is you said that when you were maybe this was when you were in texas you're from texas right i've yeah. got that right and i'm remembering this correctly Correct. uh and when your parents you went to school obviously to to do this um but when you were telling your parents that you wanted to do this you know you were like well oh, you know and, and and they're like well can you really like make a living doing this can you really do this and and you said that you remember thinking someone has this job why can't that someone be me right yeah and, uh, and another thing that you said is that I'm just giving away all the good shit. This that is came great, from no, the this is a great session. trailer, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> but another thing that you said, which I really liked is you said, if your like 20 year old self could see yourself in your studio today, you know, that you would be freaking out, like knowing that you had a garage studio in your house and this is what you were doing for a living. Like you'd be so proud of yourself and like freaking out. And I just, I, I love that. And I'm just curious, like, tell us, tell us just more about like kind of that journey and figuring out, like knowing that this is what you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And then like that fight to figure out how to do it. Like how what was it? your, mm -hmm. yeah. What was your journey? Yeah. To be honest, I, I, I've done a lot of like thinking about this over the years because it seems like kind of a unique thing like but, but I never I never had to like wonder what it was that I wanted to do like so many of my friends that were in college mm -hmm. were undecided at first and they would change their majors and um, even when we were in high school you know people start to ask you like oh what are you gonna do after high school and a lot of people are like I don't know like sales I guess I don't what you know <laughs> and um, and I I uniquely never like had a had a question to that question. I, I always knew that that I wanted to do something in music. Um and it probably was because of, like I wasn't I was an only child. I have a half sister that I didn't really see much growing up, but I I spent a lot of time alone in uh my dad's garage with a drum set and a couple of microphones and guitars and just like figuring out how to like put music into the computer I was fascinated with that mm. and um playing in bands and stuff like that around town so I was so obsessed with it that I was like I need to go to school for this um and luckily like I lived near a school that did that so yeah naturally in high school when your family starts to ask you like okay like you're about to graduate from high school you're gonna go to college right what are you gonna do um I'm like oh music and they're like what I don't know if that's a good idea. Uh, and I, yeah, specifically remember like multiple family members being like, are you going to be able to make money? Like you need to make money, which is a totally valid thing for an older family member to say, like you need to eat and like survive um, and make money. That's like a necessary thing. But I just remember, yeah, exactly. Like you said, I remember thinking it wasn't like a conscious decision. It was just like, 
well, well, people make li- like this. This career exists. Someone's making mm. money doing this. Why can't that be me? And I and and there are some people who are underrepresented. Like I think women are highly underrepresented in the music production world, which is changing, by the way, like he- heavily changing quickly. Um, and there are initiatives to like get more women in music, which is awesome. But but I had the privilege to say like, oh, like no, I can totally see myself doing this like i already do it in my garage i'll just get better at it i'll just be the best and i'll make money that way um and it wasn't conceited or like egotistical it was just like matter of fact i guess um it was believing in yourself as well totally yeah there was just like Mm -hmm. i think an appropriate level of like yeah maybe i was a little scared but like i could i can figure this out like other Mm -hmm. people have why not me Mm. I'm curious to hear about how you feel about being in in the role you are now. Was that always what you wanted or was there a different way you wanted to be working in music? Like, did you want to be the front man, you know, performing on stage at the tours that you're now currently on behind the scenes? I think very early on, anyone who does my job would be lying to you if they said they didn't at some point start out that way. And, you know, when I was in bands, when I was 15 and 16, I'm like, oh, yeah, like I want to be a drummer in the biggest band in the world or I want to be the lead singer and you know whatever and I I would like play shows around town at coffee shops and stuff like that but I remember like once I started recording stuff I I that was more fun I was like okay mm. I just want to find more stuff to record like I don't really like mm. performing this as much as I like to just make it sound good and once I figured that out I was like this is what I want to do it was way more fun and and then there was a school nearby that like had studios and stuff like that and i was like this is so fun i can't believe Mm -hmm. that you can go to school for this um so yeah it 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 quick very early on in life changed to the thing i'm doing now Mm. it seems Um, like an art uh you're always kind of like defending it in a way like there's mm -hmm. this like impracticality with like people who like especially people who are older than us that like you said they're just like well you got to make money you got to eat right so uh but they're they're just like oh you're gonna do you're gonna be an art major you're gonna be a a music production major you're gonna be like what are you what are you gonna do with that you know like there's always like this impracticality that people seem to think that's around doing things that's creative mm. because i feel like creativity is like inherently very just like you kind of make it up as you go and that you know is like inherently very uncertain to people and it just is like mm. it just doesn't seem viable to somebody it's like well why don't you just like work your way up, up some corporate ladder and make yourself like you know and you work on a retirement and do all the things that like all the safe choices you know yeah Yeah. right and that's a traditional mindset that i think has changed a lot and it may be skewed because i live in a place where i'm surrounded by people who do that like like i think over 30 percent of people in nashville are self-employed but like where i'm from that was a very like untraditional like scary thing to do like you go work at a bank that your dad started and you work your way up and you take over the bank or whatever um (laughs) so yeah, it was it was definitely unheard of where I'm from, but I think with the proliferation of things like content creators and social media and TikToks and I heard you guys talking about long talks and all kinds of new stuff, there's like <laughs> there's uh there's this new expectation that like young people can be like, "Oh, I I can figure out a way to make money doing what I'm good at and I don't need to go learn to do something that I hate." Mm-hmm. Um to to, you know, trade yeah. my time for money for the rest of my life yeah that's the good part about like surrounding yourself with people that are like in it like you are like if you're yeah. surrounding, in, a, in a in a place like nashville where like you said 30 percent of people are like self-employed and tons of people i'm sure per capita are in the music industry in one way or the other um it's just like if you surround yourself with people like that it kind of adds like a certain level of like confidence and legitimacy to that choice mm-hmm. then if you're just like in odessa texas saying i'm gonna be uh, you know the front man in a in the next rolling stones or whatever you know what i totally. mean like, <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. and there's some there's some some other sides of that too like constantly as creatives i think we compare ourselves to other people and i'm yeah 110 percent guilty of that like some days Alyssa knows this i'll come in the house and be like i should quit music my friends are way better at this than me everyone's gonna find out i don't know what i'm doing but um, <laughs> you, you sort of struggle through that. And, and honestly, like if you have a good community around you and a good like support system like I have with my wife, like they, they're there for you in those moments. And they're like, hey, we all feel this way sometimes. It's okay. You're great. Keep going. So, um, yeah, it's good to be in a good mm-hmm. community for sure. 
Yeah. One of the things, um, as like a, a third party, one of the things that you said to me during our, our, when we were filming the creator session is that sometimes you, you don't view yourself as a creator. You view yourself as the guy that's just like pushing the buttons, right? Like doing the stuff. Now you said that to me and I remember thinking like, okay. Um, (laughs) because, because I was watching right as an outsider and I'm watching, you have Mara who's, you know, has amazing vocals and you have the team around her and they're all musicians. Right. And you have, you were like, the orchestra symphony leader, right? You were standing in and like, you were like, Oh, I hear this. I hear that. And you were communicating like there's, it was really interesting to me because I think it changed in some cases, it changed what my perspective even of a creator was. There's so many different types of creators out there. And I think that, um, a lot of people don't, I have a hard time identifying themselves as a creator because their perspective as a creator is the person that's in the front, that is the front man. Right. And I watched you and I was like, Thomas is the most creative person in the room right now (laughs) because you were managing so many things. And I thought it was, I just thought it was the coolest thing I've ever seen. I was like this, the fact that this is your job. I was like, this is so cool. I wish I could have this talent. Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> Thanks for I saying that. Yeah, on, on my on my unhealthy days, I'm like, I just feel like I'm uh, an unnecessary cog in the wheel of music. But on good days, for sure, I realize like, yeah, this requires some uh, a, a unique blend of like technical skill and pushing buttons and frequencies and science, but also like you need to be able to think like abstractly and and hear things that don't exist yet and think what kind of texture would be good here that would accentuate the vocal or like what kind of uh, rhyme scheme would help push the momentum of the song forward um, or even like what do I like about this that I want to turn up and what do I not like that I want to turn down or stuff like that. So mm-hmm. it, it it's definitely like uh creative adjacent and enough to be like uh <laughs> i think considered a, a creative um job for sure definitely i think i'm i'm sure there's also some element of coaching to what you do as well right in with the artists you work with because it's not only having the idea but it's like how do i like get them to see this too and like coach them in the direction that the song needs to go in that maybe isn't where they were wanting to take it. I'm basing uh, all of yeah. that off some music documentaries I've watched. I don't know if that's actually the case. No, for it's <laughs> so true. And especially for me, cause I feel like um, at this point in my career, like I work with a lot of artists that are not necessarily like ones you've heard on the radio yet. So um, they might have some uh, insecurity or um, just like unknown part of what they're doing and and um yeah part of my job is definitely to translate like here's what i'm hearing try it this way i'm trying to encourage you while also telling you to do something different yeah it's a it's a hard balance sometimes but it's um coaching creative people is a certain type of skill that's involved for sure a certain type of skill that's involved. Yeah. I, like I said, I loved it. I thought Thomas was like a magician in that room. I'll tell you that much. It was amazing. I was Um, glad that you were here. So can't wait for people to see it. Yeah, it was great. Um, what would be some advice that you would offer people that were trying to pursue a similar type of uh, career that you're doing? And I know that you started a long time ago and the advice is going to be different than the advice that you followed. Um, but, but what's some advice to, to people that are trying to build a career? Cause you do a lot of different things, which is, is cool. Like, right. You produce, you engineer, you tour, you do all these things. And it really created this really sustainable, like long-term career for you. And you're not just committed to doing one part of one thing. Um, so yeah. What, what advice would you offer to someone who's, who's chasing this? Yeah. Somebody who wants to do what I do needs to like love music, um, in a way that, is outside of like ego or mm-hmm. um, outside of um, the the need to make a living. Honestly, like if you go into it thinking you're gonna make a lot of money and this is an opportunity for that, it's you're gonna fall on your face, guaranteed. Um, but but if you are that person and you're like, wow, I really um, enjoy the technical part of music and want to chase that. Um, honestly, yeah, it is a lot different now. I would say somebody that wants to do that now, like go to YouTube. I this sounds so <laughs> dumb. Like, I can't believe I'm saying that, but like go, there, there are some, there's, and there's some terrible information out there and you're going to have to filter, 
uh, mm. what you what you consume because there is some really bad advice and people who don't know what they're talking about. But there's some there's never been a better time to learn stuff about um, music production on YouTube. Um, you just have to like be really diligent about it. But there are also great schools. Like I think that's still a viable option if you mm. live near a community college or something like that that has an audio program. That's a real legit thing. You know it it. Oh, the the number one I would say thing is like to do it. Just like f know that you're gonna fail and it's like not gonna be good for a long time. But like mm -hmm. figure out a way to do it. Get a mic, get a converter, and uh, one pair of headphones. Just go after it. You probably have a laptop with GarageBand, and like that's how I started. It was just like trying it and using what I had and improvising. And then over the over time, you'll kind of figure out like what's uh. What, what works and what doesn't and, and tweak from there. But yeah, there's, there's the, the world is like open to you on youtube.com. It's pretty insane. Yeah. Teddy, Teddy popped in and said that Kygo learned to be a music producer on YouTube. So wow. yeah, it doesn't there you go. I have, I have a question for Thomas on this. Since you said that like, that there's a lot of information out there that isn't great. Have you ever thought about making a music production course? In you know, people hmm. online? I, I, I'm <laughs> Haley can actually attest to this. I am terrible at video. Like the fact that you can even see me right now is a miracle. But um, <laughs> I have thought about. I have a friend who who started. He bought like a really nice camera and some lights, and and he started making some instructional videos. I think he's gonna do. So I didn't want to like step on his toes. But um, yeah, if if so, every now and then I'm, I'm like maybe I should write an ebook or something. Alyssa's always telling me to like create a. Uh, uh, whatever like streams of passive streams of income that people can download and i should make my yeah make an ebook sell it on convert commerce yeah, perfect yeah, that's yeah. What Alyssa, well, Alyssa's trying to manage that for me yeah well i mean so much of your business now has been established through word of mouth right like you have established clients that you work with and you don't necessarily promote the same way you're not trying to do mass quantity right mass yeah. mass you work with individual creators and and help them create what what they hear um but yeah you for sure should also on your website i was looking and you have an old blog you have an old blog on there. Oh gosh, yeah. <laughs> Thomas, revive that man. Oh revive gosh, it yeah. And... I probably I need to update my website. I probably have four entries on my blog total over the last uh, ten years. Yes, yes. Um, the other thing, the last question that I have for you, which is um one of my favorite things that um that I remember that you um had said and that I'd love to hear you talk about, is um and and kind of if you could parlay this into if anyone out there who's watching this, who is a musician themselves, and they're looking to hire a producer, one of the things that you talked about was that how your take on being a producer, like your, your take on it, everybody approaches it a little bit different and about how you, um, as a producer, you know, that in that space that, you know, their name is, goes on big letters in the front and your name goes. And, and I remember if I'm remembering correctly, that was a mentor said that to you, right? Yeah. I, one of my first jobs was working for another producer and I was sort of just managing the studio and he was gracious to let me even work there. Cause I, I definitely didn't have, that was another case where I didn't have the experience, shouldn't have been in the room, but I learned a lot from being there. But, um, yeah, he told me, I used to hear him tell his artists that like at the end of the day, your name is going to go on the CD at the front in big letters and my name goes on the back in really small letters. Mm. And that's just like a beautiful way of communicating that at the end of the day, like the artist wrote this song and is communicating to their fans. Um, and it's not the producer's job to like take over and sort of steamroll whatever vision the artist has, but rather to come alongside them and guide them into what they want to make. Um, and sure, it is a creative process to guide the artist, um, but at the end of the day, it's not our song. It's not our art. Um, we're just there to facilitate that and and um, be sort of the mountain guide for, for the artist. Mm -hmm. Is that not, is he not the most humble person you've ever met, man? Like I said, if you could see him, I'm like, the Thomas is so cool and he's so good at what he does. And I just love hearing you talk because your humility, humility just like always blows my mind. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. Uh, so like I said, if you're, if you're a musician uh, in the Nashville area and looking for a producer, I give my endorsement because I know all, <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> but seriously, um, this has been great. Do you guys have any other questions? 
Where can people go to find Thomas if they want to follow yes. online and see what he's up to? Yeah, I, I um, I, I struggle with. Um, if you want to see those four blog posts, yeah, you right can there, ThomasDoolan.com. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like of all the internet things, I'm probably most active on Instagram. But but even that, like, I'm Alyssa knows this too. Like, I'm terrible. I don't post like enough. I should I should do that more. I should like let people in on what what's going on. But yeah, I have an Instagram. It's just Thomas Doolin. Great. Awesome. All right, friends. Well, uh, up next is supposed to be that listener shout out. And you know, we just haven't gotten one uh, for this week. And so we're going to throw this back up on here. It's uh, convert.it uh, forward slash listener shout out. Uh, you'll find that in the show notes as well. Make sure to go in there and tell us something that you either are working on that you want to celebrate really anything. We want to make sure that we celebrate your success. Big or small. Yeah. yeah th Thomas, what's a, what's a recent success that you've had? Oh gosh. Uh, put him on the spot. I know. Yeah. I know. I'm sorry. Um, I've had a few mixes I've done recently across a million streams on Spotify um, oh yeah, that is, which is cool. that is a good one. Yeah, yes. so it's fun to see people enjoy like something that I like labored over in my garage. <laughs> <laughs> that's a cool garage. I don't know if I'd call that a garage, <laughs> but um, that's a perfect one. That's a perfect uh, one to end on. So if you have something similar to that, some sort of success, please make sure that you share it with us so we can share your successes um, because it's one of those things that just like makes you keep going, right? Yeah. Um, and then what we've got up next week, I won't be here. I'm going to be uh, filming some sessions in uh, creator sessions in Los Angeles. So I will be out next week, but I think Miguel is taken over and the topic is going to be top mistakes that new creators make when selling digital products. And Thomas, maybe you should join this one. I'm going to watch so that for way, sure. So, so that way you can get some when you make your ebook for yeah. when you make your ebook. <laughs> number one mistake is probably not doing it right, Miguel. Uh, yeah, that's probably yeah. number one. Yeah, I need to fix that one. Yes. Yes. All right, friends. Well, thank you so much for joining. We will see you next week or they will see you next week. I won't be here. Have a good rest of your week. And Thomas, again, thanks so much for joining. Thanks for having me, guys.